Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadikap. Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today I'd like to share a very special podcast with you. I was interviewed by Charles Rayner of Sibi YouTube channel. He's from the Philippines and had many questions for me regarding Gautama Buddha's teachings. He's just getting started with learning and exploring Buddhism. His background is within the Christian teachings and he will explain that he's actually an atheist and has no belief in God at this time. So he's looking for information to help him understand Buddhism and share that with other Filipinos within his country and all other viewers who are accessing his videos and podcasts from his YouTube channel. Charles had a lot of very interesting questions that I think you'll find helpful especially if you've come from a Christian background and are now moving into learning Buddhist teachings. So I would like to invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy this talk. Please understand that certain sections of this podcast, the audio isn't quite as clear as it usually is when I'm recording on my own because this recording came from another application. Here's the interview of me speaking with Charles just the other day. I'm planning to post this as a vlog entry to my YouTube channel, but it doesn't really have a specific topic. I really discuss anything in this world, anything that I can see around. It could be jokes, it could be cooking, general information. So I, I just thought that I need to discuss Buddhism because this is something that is not familiar here in the Philippines. We are more of a Christian country. A lot of people here that you can just go around and people here are Catholics and Christians. Yeah, there's a lot of similarities between Christianity and Buddhism. The Buddha and Jesus Christ were both essentially sharing teachings to help humanity to live a better life. Yeah, right? I agree. What it really comes down to is universal love of all beings, doing no harm, and being a good moral person. Yeah. And the way that the Buddha taught those and shared those is in one way very clear very concise evidence-based independently verifiable teachings where jesus christ teachings were essentially teaching the same thing in terms of universal love of all beings doing no harm and being a good moral person but he taught more through belief and you know just believe me and follow me and these are the teachings that came from god where the Buddhist teachings were discussed in a way that could be independently verified, not based on belief. The reason why I love Buddha and Jesus at the same time, uh, they're very inspirational. They teach about humility. I am an atheist. I, I do not believe in any God. I do not believe that Jesus Christ is a God. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I'm open to any proof. I'm open to any religion. So if I discuss something about Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, I'm very open to it. I love learning about culture and different religions. Uh, do you consider Buddhism as a religion? It's important to answer that question to first define what religion is. Mm -hmm. To me, what a religion is, is a religion is rites and rituals and ceremonies, kind of like obligations that are kind of shared by a centralized organization. And disseminated throughout various venues in order to have the followers or the community of people practice these rites, rituals, and ceremonies and, and teachings. If that's how we define religion, then Gautama Buddha's 
teachings wouldn't be a religion because there are no rites, there are no rituals, there are no ceremonies. There is no centralized organization that's kind of collecting the teachings and distributing them out through all the various venues. Essentially what the Buddha said when he discovered enlightenment is he said, I discovered a better way to live life. It's more of a life practice than it is a religion because there are no rites, rituals, and ceremonies associated with his teachings. Okay. And there is no centralized organization that's collecting the teachings and sharing them throughout the world. It's up to each individual practitioner to learn with teachers and then implement those teachings in your daily life as a life practice, as a better way of life. So it's more of a philosophy than a religion. Some people call it a philosophy. Essentially what Buddhism is, is it teaches you how to train the mind to eliminate discontent feelings such as sadness or anger or frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fears, loneliness, boredom, shyness, jealousy, resentment. Yeah. When somebody gets to enlightenment, they have eliminated what I would call discontentness and the mind is permanently peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. That must be very difficult, especially that those feelings and emotions that you have mentioned earlier are natural reactions and things. So when something is broken, when something is not met on time, when our expectations are not met, when our goals are not reached, then we get disappointed, we get angry. So I think Buddhism can really help people who are suffering from those ill feelings every time. Yeah, and the key word that you use there is people typically react in this way, right? With anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, right? They react. And what the Buddhist teachings are about is training the mind to respond to situations rather than reacting out of discontent feelings. So we respond with calmness, with peacefulness, with contentness, with evenness of temper with active goodwill towards all beings, with compassion, with a calm mental state where you're not going to experience anger and frustration, irritation, all these other discontent feelings. So it's not about reacting. That's kind of like an animalistic instinct is to react to a situation where training in the Buddhist teachings and training the mind is to become more and more and more human where we're now able to peacefully respond to situations that we encounter on a daily basis. And when you say reaction to all beings, that includes animals, non-humans, plants, trees. Right, because like you said, when the mind is displeased or disappointed or dissatisfied, the mind tends to react with a negative emotion of anger or frustration or irritation or something else. So by training the mind that it's not always going to be pleased, that everything's not going to go your way and to be comfortable with change, then the mind can respond with peacefulness, with calmness, with steadiness, rather than react with anger and frustration. You know, I really can't imagine a world when all the people are reacting that way, it would be very peaceful. I mean, people today are very impatient with time and their goals, like just a small thing and they become frustrated. Some become very depressed, hopeless. This is one of the reasons why the Buddhist teachings are so revolutionary and so profound is because they're not based on belief. Mm -hmm. You're actively training your mind and you can see the improvements for yourself. So things that, you know, a couple of weeks or a couple of months ago that made you angry, now today they make you irritated and they make you annoyed and all of a sudden you feel nothing when these things happen and you just feel so peaceful. So you can observe the changes in the quality of your mind through learning and practicing his teachings. So that's why they're not based on belief where you just have to believe, 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 and believe. And then when you die, you hope you did everything correct. Mm -hmm. You actually learn teachings, you train the mind, you see the condition of the mind gradually improve. And then you have the truth for yourself that you see that these teachings are in fact working. 
I like that. Being in a Christian country, I have some questions that may compare Christianity to Buddhism. A lot of people here are misinterpreting Buddhism as another religion or Buddha as a god. So can you clarify that Buddha is a god or not? The Buddha is not a god. He was a human being who experienced similar problems as we experienced, that the mind became angry and frustrated and irritated. When he was a prince, you know, his mind experienced various emotions and feelings just the way that we do today. And then through him observing how discontent his mind was and how discontent the people in his kingdom were, he decided to leave from the royal palace and seek out a better way of living through training the mind. And he essentially discovered these teachings. He got his mind to a point where he was able to eliminate frustration, irritation, annoyance, anger, all of these feelings. And then he started to teach from the age of 35 until he died at 80. He taught and essentially he considered himself a teacher. He never called himself a god. He never called himself a prophet. He never called himself a savior or a lord or a messiah. Some people you'll see that they will translate and call Gautama Buddha a lord. They'll call him Lord okay. Buddha or Lord Gautama Buddha. But this is not an accurate translation based on what he actually talked about during his life. Mm -hmm. When he talked to, during his life, he admitted that he was just a human, just like everyone else. He happened to discover through his active journey in his pursuit to learn how to attain enlightenment, he discovered these teachings. And then through that discovery, he decided to share them with other people so they could attain the same mental state as him. Okay. Um, how about Buddha himself? Does he believe in any god or any deity? The Buddha didn't teach whether God exists or whether God doesn't exist, right? Some people will tell you that the Buddha denied that God existed, but in fact, in his teachings, he discusses God occasionally here and there. But what he essentially says is that we shouldn't be attached to God, looking for God to create change in our life. Because if we want a better life, we have to create that life for ourselves. So what ends up happening with some practitioners of other traditions is there's a lot of prayer and a lot of worship yeah. asking for God to create change in your life and then nothing ever happens, right? And that's because God doesn't do that. God isn't like a genie in a bottle where you can ask wishes and then God's going to fulfill that wish. Yeah. So what the Buddha was saying in his teachings was, if you want a better life, you have to do the work yourself. And here's what you need to do. And he delivered the teachings to explain people what to do to train their mind and how to create a better life for themselves. I like so that. he didn't teach whether God exists or whether God doesn't exist. He just said, don't be attached to God and expect God to change your life. You have to do the work yourself. I agree. I agree. I like that. Because words without actions is just it's just nothing you just can't entrust anything to a force to a power or to another creature to do that thing for you without your action you cannot do something yeah and if you think about it jesus christ essentially said the same thing jesus christ said that he was a teacher he called himself a teacher during his life he called himself a teacher he delivered teachings he said you know don't lie, don't steal, don't kill people, don't have sexual misconduct, don't take alcohol and intoxicants, yeah. you know, love each other, love your neighbors. Um, if you do good things, good things will happen, right? He said, you reap what you sow. He said, love thy neighbor. He, he shared all of these same teachings and he was guiding people in how to conduct their lives that would improve the quality of their life. But since Jesus' life 2,000 years ago, what people have evolved to today is they think that Jesus taught that he's going to snap his fingers and everything's going to change. And, you know, if you just pray to God, then God will change everything for you. God will but provide. God, 
Yeah, Jesus didn't teach this at all. This is a very big misconception in the Christian world. Jesus said, you reap what you sow. This is karma or gamma, right? If you do good things, good things will come to you. If you do bad things, bad things will come to you. This is you reap what you sow. Jesus taught, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery and sexual misconduct, don't lie, don't take intoxicants. He taught people how to have a good speech and speaking in, in kind, polite ways. He taught people to be loving and kind and compassionate. These are all the same similar teachings as the Buddha, but unfortunately from 2000 years ago during Jesus's lifetime, people have gotten far away from the teachings and they kind of have come to this conclusion that Jesus is going to come back. He's going to snap his fingers and everything's going to be perfect. And this isn't possible because if Jesus was going to do that, he would have did it the first time. He would have did it when he was here the first time if he was going to do that. <laughs> and even if he did, if he snapped his fingers and everything completely changed instantly, well, as soon as he dies, everybody's going to get right back into the same problem again because they haven't learned how to be kind, how to be loving, how to be compassionate, how to not kill, how to not steal, not commit adultery and not lie and, and, and not to take intoxicants. So if he instantly snapped his fingers, he'd have to snap his fingers every day and keep changing <laughs> the world every single day because everybody hasn't learned how to improve the quality of their life. So Jesus delivered teachings when he came the first time and asked people to practice these teachings in order to be closer to God. By practicing these teachings, you will have a closer relationship with God. And essentially what Gautama Buddha said is, practice these teachings and you will experience a better life. You will eliminate anger, sadness, frustration, boredom, loneliness, all these discontent feelings. So essentially what Jesus was talking about with the Holy Spirit and getting closer to God, Gautama Buddha was talking about with enlightenment. And he said, this will improve the quality of your life. He didn't have God as part of the picture, which is really nice because any Christians who are practicing Jesus Christ's teachings, they can actually learn and practice Gautama Buddha's teachings along with Christianity. Okay. Because Jesus okay. said, you know, don't worship any false gods. Well, Gautama Buddha doesn't teach worship at all. You know, Jesus Christ said, I'm the only Lord and Savior. The Buddha said, I'm just a teacher, and okay. you can learn my teaching. So there's no conflict whatsoever in terms of being Christian and actually practicing the Buddhist teachings. And a lot of Christians actually say that through learning the Buddhist teachings, they actually become a better Christian. They actually understand Jesus' teachings a lot better through understanding the Buddhist teachings. When Buddhists go to the temple, or monks go to the temple, kneel, bow to Buddha, that doesn't mean that they're worshiping? No, everything in the Buddhist teachings is all about training the mind. So the Buddha himself never told anybody to make any statues of him, but people did. People ended up making statues, even though he told people, you know, this isn't what he was interested in sharing. Yeah. He wasn't interested in being worshipped and, you know, admired. He was interested in seeing people practice the teachings. So today when people are bowing to statues, some people that misunderstand the teachings, they may tell you that they're bowing to the Buddha, but people who are practicing the real teachings of what he actually taught, what you might hear from them is they'll say, you know, I'm bowing in order to show my gratitude and appreciation for the teachings. Yeah. And I'm doing it in order to kind of empty my ego and eliminate the ego because part of the path to enlightenment is to eliminate the ego. And some people will bow in order to kind of humble themselves and become more peaceful. Okay, that's great. I also reviewed the Four Noble Truths, the key to Buddhism. And one of the noble truths that I have here uh, that we have is Nirodha. Nirodha is when we want something, we do something to achieve that, 
and that creates the karma if I, uh, that's either good or bad karma. Uh, it also states here that we need to stop the process of reincarnation. Does that mean that reincarnation itself is bad? Charles, I think the content that you have isn't 100% accurate, but let me share this <laughs> okay. with you so I can help you a little bit. Let's talk about reincarnation first, okay? The Buddha never taught reincarnation. This is a big misunderstanding, so it doesn't surprise me that you've gotten this information probably off the internet because a lot of people think the Buddha taught reincarnation, but what he actually taught is the cycle of rebirth. Okay, they're, they're actually two different things. Mm -hmm. What reincarnation is based on is reincarnation, the belief that people have in this is that there's some kind of soul that transcends multiple lives and it keeps being reincarnated over multiple existences. And each time it comes back, it has a new body, but it's the same soul. This is what reincarnation is, mm -hmm. but this isn't what the Buddha taught. What the Buddha taught is that there's the cycle of rebirth where we're continually reborn countless times over and over and over again until we attain enlightenment. And when we're reborn, it's a new body and it's a new mind. It's a new existence. There's no entity that goes from one life to the next. It's actually a completely new being that is in existence. So this is the difference between the reincarnation and the cycle of rebirth. Part of the Buddha's teachings is he taught what's called non-self. He also taught impermanence, where there is no thing that's permanent, right? So like your eyeglasses that you have on right now, those aren't permanent. You're not going to keep those permanently. Yeah. You're going to lose them someday. Or they're they do not have lenses. Or your they don't have lenses. Or, or, or your prescription. <laughs> or they don't have lenses. Or, or, or <laughs> who knows, right? Like, so these glasses are not permanent. There's nothing permanent. Like your hair, it's constantly growing. Like the, the, your body is constantly changing. Yeah. So he taught that there's nothing that's permanent. So this teaching that people share about reincarnation where there's this re-emerging soul over multiple existences it conflicts with his teachings he never taught reincarnation he taught the cycle of rebirth that we're born throughout these five realms and being in the human realm is the most desirable because in the human realm we can attain enlightenment where like as an animal you can't attain enlightenment so what we have in this human birth is we have the ability to learn and practice the teachings in order to train the mind and cultivate the mind to attain enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, then we won't be reborn. And the goal is to not be reborn because while you've experienced certain pleasant and enjoyable things in life, life is a little bit miserable if you think about it, right? Like we're, we get sick, we get old, our body hurts, you know, we die, our loved ones die, there's sadness, there's sorrow, there's relationships, there's breakups, there's, you know, injuries, there's, while certain parts of life are enjoyable and we try to focus on those, living and being in existence is a little bit miserable if you kind of think about it. Yeah. So the we're just trying to be to happy. Be reborn. Yeah. Well. Well, that's a whole other thing. But we're we're constantly reborn, and we're experiencing this sickness, this aging, this death. And the way to eliminate sickness, aging, and death is to never be reborn again. Okay. So if we're reborn, okay. then we're going to keep experiencing sickness, aging, and death, and the miseries of life. So. Yes, the goal is to not be reborn again. And the way that you do that is through attaining enlightenment and through learning and practicing the teachings, you will see your mind will become more peaceful, more calm, serene, and content with joy. So you know you're progressing on this path and you see that you no longer have anger or sadness or frustration. So you know your mind is becoming more and more enlightened 
gradually over time. So you're moving closer and closer to this ideal mental state of enlightenment. And once you attain it, your mind is permanently peaceful, permanently calm, permanently serene, permanently content, and you have permanent joy where your mind no longer experiences sadness or anger or frustration. So this is how we know that these teachings are truth because the more you learn them and practice them, you see the condition of your mind improve. Can you reach nirvana during death only or can you, can you reach that when you're still alive? You can attain it while you're alive and then you can enjoy the rest of your life with this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. So you have a very peaceful life for the rest of your life or you can attain it at death. So you can attain it in both places. But the ideal situation would be to attain it before death because that way you can enjoy this mental state for the rest of your life. And it becomes a very wonderful life when your mind is permanently peaceful, yeah. calm, serene, content with joy because everything you experience in life is through the mind. So if your mind becomes permanently peaceful with joy, then life is just so wonderful and so marvelous and you get to enjoy that for the rest of your life. That's very relaxing to hear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's one of the things the Buddha said when he said, you know, when you attain enlightenment, it's like laying down the stress because you no longer feel any stress okay. when you attain enlightenment. We think that stress is like a normal thing in life and that we just have to deal with it. And we think that sadness is just like a normal thing in life. And we think that loneliness and boredom, we just think that, okay, I'm just going to have to deal with this. This is emotions that I'm having. But when you learn about the Buddhist teachings, you actually learn that you can eliminate stress. You can eliminate sadness. You can eliminate boredom and loneliness. All these discontent mental states, you can actually eliminate them from the mind. You don't have to live with them. What if there is a death in the family and one person would feel sad and depressed about it? Does that mean that Buddhism would like to remove that sadness from that person? Or is it normal to feel sad even if you're following the Buddhist philosophy? In the unenlightened mind, the unenlightened mind will still experience sadness. But if the mind is enlightened, you won't experience any sadness at all, even when somebody close to you dies. See, we associate that when somebody dies and you feel sad, that means you must have really loved them. But in reality, what it means is your mind is holding on to them it's with the this strong the attachment. the attachment. That's the longing, the strong eagerness where the mind's holding on and it's trying to keep mom or dad or grandma or grandpa permanently. And when the mind latches on to grandma, and then she dies, now the mind experiences sadness or anger or frustration or loneliness because grandma is gone. Where if you recognize through all these various teachings and you train your mind, grandma can die and you still feel calm and peaceful and content because you appreciate the time that you had with her mm -hmm. and you have joy that you an appreciation for this life that you got to share with her, but you won't experience sadness. You have true love, which is love without attachment, where the mind isn't feeling sad and lonely and all of these other discontent feelings. So this grieving process that the mind goes through when you lose a loved one, this is part of the unenlightened mind and what happens to the mind when it's unenlightened. But when the mind is enlightened, people can die and you don't feel any grief or sorrow or sadness because you can feel appreciation and gratitude for the time that you spent with this person. Rather than having the carpet pulled out from under your feet when a loved one passes away, because in the Christian teachings, they're kind of taught that when somebody dies, that's God taking them away from you. And all of a sudden, people start fearing God, right? Yeah. We don't have to fear God. We don't have to fear God. God, isn't, God didn't take that person away from you. You know, there's only one reason why people die. Do you know what that is? What is it? 
It's because they were born. Okay. Everybody has to die. Everyone has to die. There's no getting around that. As long as you're human, you have to die. So God isn't taking people away from us. That's not what God does. He's not punishing us or taking people away from us. We're just dying because we're human. We have to die. There's no other way around that. You know, whatever arises has to cease to exist. This is impermanence, that there's nothing that's permanent. So this human body isn't permanent. It has to die. And God isn't the one who determines who dies and who lives. That's not what God does. (laughs) But a lot of people... A lot of people are taught that way. Yeah. And that's um, why the, oftentimes there's a lot of sorrow and sadness at death. Is it, is it not rather insensitive when your loved one has died and you're not feeling sad or upset at all and you're just celebrating because they have lived their lives happily? Well, you don't have to celebrate when somebody dies, right? Like here in Thailand, when somebody dies, the family gets together. They all gather at the temple. They usually have the body out for like three days or so. Sometimes they'll have the body at the family's house. And over the period of about three to five days, all the family and all the villagers come together. They spend time together. They talk. They eat food together. They take care of each other. And they just spend time and just enjoy spending time with each other. There's not like this enormous sadness and sorrow and Everybody just boohooing and crying. So they're not celebrating, but they're, they're just calmly, peacefully spending time together in a way that brings the family together and kind of reaffirms the family ties that we're all together. And it's an opportunity to get together with your family. So people just aren't going around, you know, like so sad and so depressed just because somebody died. Because everybody here understands death, that everybody has to die. They don't think of it as this person was taken away from me by God, right? Because that can create some sorrow and sadness if everybody thinks this person was taken away from me by God. What people understand here in Thailand is this person died because they were human. And they had to die because they were human. And everybody has to die. So there's not this big sorrow because everybody was expecting them to die. You know, they're going to die. Everybody's (laughs) going to die. Yeah. You know, but the problem that we encounter in Christian cultures is the mind wants to hold on and it's trying to hold on and hold on and hold on. And it thinks that this life should be permanent. And when grandma dies, everybody's crying and upset. Like, oh, why did she have to die? She left. Oh, you know, God took her away from us. Like, they took her too soon. God took her away from us too soon. She shouldn't have died. No, that's not reality. God didn't take her away. She died because she was human. And her heart gave out or her lungs gave out or her kidneys gave out or whatever it was. It's just the way the human body works. That's a very positive way of accepting death because a lot of us are denying that there is death. I mean, not really denying. A lot of us know that we will all be dying, but not too soon, not this time. Even if we're already 100 years old, people will be shocked. Why did he die? It's too soon. He's too young. Well, if everybody truly knew that what they were taught is truth, right? Because what everyone's taught in the Christian culture, they have this belief that as long as you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you die, you're going to go to heaven with God. That's what everyone's taught as a belief. Well, if that's what is true, and everybody knows that to be true, then when someone dies, wouldn't that be a celebration that now they're with God? Yeah. But it's not, because people's (laughs) minds, it's not true that that's what happens necessarily So a lot of people, when someone dies, they're sad. But why are you sad? Because if you really truly knew that what you believe is true, that when someone dies, as long as they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, they will go to heaven, then why would you cry when someone dies? Because that's the ultimate goal, right? And also, if you believe if you believe that, that as long as you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you die, you will go to heaven, 
then why is everybody so afraid to die? If they knew it was truth 100% that as long as they accept Jesus as their savior, they will go to heaven, then people wouldn't fear death. They should be excited about death because they will finally meet Jesus or God. Exactly. But the problem is that that's not what they understand as truth. They just believe it and they don't know if it's true or not. They're just believing it and they don't know if it's true. And this is why the mind is so sad and discontent because they just believe it. They don't know that it's true. But in the Buddhist teachings, what he's doing is he's giving you wisdom that you can independently see for yourself that is true. And when you attain enlightenment, you understand the truth because you've independently verified all the teachings. Nothing is based on belief. And you've right. seen your mind go from angry and sad and frustrated to completely peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. So when you see your mind do that over several years, then you know what the truth is, is that these teachings led exactly where the Buddha said they would to a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. And it's permanent mental state. Christians believe that if you're a good person, you go to heaven. If you're a bad person, you go to hell. How about in Buddhism belief, where do people go after they die? Do you have your own version of heaven and hell? The Buddha teaches five realms. There's hell. There's what's called afflicted spirits, which are kind of like demons and ghosts and things like this. Mm -hmm. There's the animal realm. There's the human realm. And then there's the heavenly realm. Okay. Now that we're in the human realm, if we attain enlightenment and we die, the Buddha never said what happens next because he never experienced it. He was born multiple times. And then his last birth, he attained enlightenment. And then when he died, he didn't know what was next because he never experienced it. That was the first time he experienced it. So he only ever taught things that he experienced that he could prove that were truth, that you could prove that it was truth. So he didn't say, once you attain Nibbana, what's next? But we do know that if you don't attain Nibbana, you will be reborn. You will be reborn into one of these realms. And it may be the human realm, but it may be one of the lower realms. Okay. It all depends on your gamma, the results of your decision. So if you improve the condition of your mind really, really well, you'll be reborn back into the human realm or potentially into the heavenly realm. But if you make a lot of bad decisions, then you'll be reborn down into one of the lower realms. And once you're in one of these lower realms, you have to keep being reborn and reborn and reborn again until you make your way back up to the human realm where you can have a chance to attain enlightenment again. So that's okay. why now that we're human, this is the very best position for us to be in to actually learn and practice the teachings to attain enlightenment. Got it. That's great. One of the things I was going to say is, you know, Buddhist practitioners are all about observing the truth and seeing the evidence with their own eyes. And one of the things that you can see is that in Thailand, about 94, 95% of the country is Buddhist. And you can see that Thailand is very peaceful. It's very loving society. They actually call Thailand the land of smiles. <laughs> right? It's because everybody's joyful. You know, and not everybody, but you know, the vast majority of the population is kind and polite and generous and loving and compassionate, and people are joyful. They're looking out for ways to peacefully coexist with other people. And they're not so interested in materialism, they're not so interested in wealth, they're not so interested in ego and kind of like everybody look at me, how you know, rich am I? They're just interested in living a very humble, peaceful life where everybody takes care of each other and everybody helps each other through this life. So you can look at the truth of the Buddhist teachings, having been here for many, many centuries, that you can see the Thai people live very peacefully together. So their teachings work very well. Whereas if you're in a country 
where whatever practices you're following, whether it's Christianity or Islam or Hindu or other teachings, while there's definitely some real benefits in those teachings, you won't necessarily find a lot of peacefulness because they're not really dedicated to training their mind. They're more functioning on belief and life can be very hectic where there can be a lot of hostility, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration. People can feel very bored and very lonely. Here in Thailand, we don't really have much of that because people are learning and practicing the Buddhist teachings, which creates a very peaceful, loving environment for everyone to coexist together peacefully. So you can see the truth for yourself that these people for many, many centuries have been learning and practicing these teachings and they're working because it's such a peaceful society. That makes me want to visit Thailand like right now. A lot of tourists come here because it's a very wonderful place to visit. And the food is outstanding. The prices are very low. They're very service oriented. So, you know, really good massages, very good quality food, fresh fruit, fresh vegetables. So their food system is very wholesome. They don't have processed food here. Their food really? is very wholesome. It's not, it's not processed food. You know, you're eating rice, you're eating vegetables. You're eating things that are grown locally. It's not packaged food or canned food. Or You go to a restaurant and your food is cooked with fresh food, like right there, fresh wow. herbs and spices. The medical system is outstanding because you get very caring and compassionate nurses and doctors who really take good care of you. And the prices here are very, very low, whether it's that. rent or food or hotels or medical expenses, because the people aren't really greedy and trying to make a whole lot of money. They're just trying to make enough money to, to get by. So the pricing in the economy is, is very low, where you can afford a, a very good lifestyle here. That's wonderful. Uh, when it comes to food co or consumption, is it true that Buddhists really do not eat meat or animals because it's taking their lives? Every Buddhist practitioner is going to practice differently, right? Because of impermanence, it's not like everybody does exactly the same thing, kind of like Christianity. You know, some people pray the rosary, some people don't. Some people are Catholic and use the holy water, and then some people don't. Everybody does something differently. Yeah. But if you look at the Buddhist teachings, he taught us to be loving and kind and compassionate and not harm animals not harm other beings because if we cause harm that harm is going to come back to us so there is definitely a certain percentage of buddhist practitioners who don't eat meat but there are some who do eat meat because everybody's moving in a progression towards enlightenment and you choose for yourself of what you should and shouldn't do there's no centralized organization that's controlling you and telling you what to do you're making choices for yourself. But we can look at the animal industry, the meat packing industry, and we can see that the Buddha taught that if we have meat, it's going to cause harm in the world. And if you look at the environment, there's a lot of research that shows that farming meat and animals causes a lot of harm in the world. Yeah. Also, there are certain drugs and antibiotics and hormones and toxins that are in the animal flesh that if we eat the animal's flesh, it harms our body. And then because now we're in the age of COVID-19, you see that humans and animals were coming close together and humans were killing animals and causing harm in this market. And now this virus has spread all throughout the world. So the teachings that the Buddha shared that if we have these type of things going on in society where we're packing meat and we're killing animals for meat and we're killing living beings, he said this is going to cause harm because if you're killing animals, that's going to cause harm to human beings. So we see the evidence of that. And that's why you can see the truth because everything the Buddha taught, you can see it for yourself. So he taught us not to kill animals. He taught us not to have meat and have occupations with meat. And he said, if you do these things, it will cause harm. And okay, that's what he said. 
But now you have to look at that teaching yourself and see was he true or not? Was it real? And if you look at COVID and you look at the harm to the earth and the planet and you look at the harm that meat does to our bodies when we invest toxins and hormones, you can see that the Buddhist teachings are true. So his teachings are shared in a way that you can independently see the truth for yourself. When it comes to COVID-19, how do you think Buddhism or belief in Buddhism can enhance the mental state of people to battle their mm -hmm. stress? So again, nothing in Buddhism is based on belief. It's all based on learning teachings, practicing those teachings and seeing the truth for yourself so you can train the mind and make the mind more calm and more peaceful. So with COVID, you know, when everybody started to be quarantined in their house, a lot of people became very bored, very lonely, right? Because their mind was craving to go outside and go to restaurants and see their friends and see their family and go to work and all of these different things. The mind is craving those things. So that's what actually caused the loneliness and the boredom because the mind wanted something else the mind became displeased and dissatisfied. It became discontent. So if somebody is learning and practicing the teachings of the Buddha and training their mind, then they're not going to experience loneliness and boredom when they're quarantined in their house for two months yeah. because they've trained their mind to eliminate boredom and eliminate loneliness. Uh, so a, a practitioner of the Buddhist teachings can be perfectly content going to work or they can be perfectly content staying at home. They have trained their mind to the point where all of those things are fine. And then also the Buddha's teachings explain to us why COVID-19 is being spread throughout the world. And it's because of the harm that we've caused to animals, that this wet market that was producing animal meat and killing animals, this is not a practice that the Buddha taught would lead to good, wholesome things. And because we were doing that as human beings, that's why this harm has come to us. It's not because God created this virus and then infected everybody and God's killing everybody. That's not what God's doing. What's happened is human beings made the choice to capture these animals, to kill these animals, and eat these animals. And because of that, choices that us humans made, that virus jumped over to the humans, and now we're affected by it. This illness and all the deaths that have resulted are caused by human beings, not by God. Very good point. I love that. My, my last question is about the law of karma. The law of karma is about when you're doing good, a lot of good things will happen to you and if you do bad something bad will also happen to you because of that action that you have done uh, who determines this action if it's good or bad because i believe that one action can be interpreted as good and interpreted as bad at the same time it depends on the situation it depends on the background of the person so let's talk about the natural law of gamma and then let's talk about what your question is about how do you determine what's a good, wholesome decision. So the natural law of gamma is cause and effect or action and result. There's a certain action that we partake, a certain decision that we make. And based on that decision, there's a certain result, right? So essentially what gamma is, is it's the result of our decisions. Okay, so for example, if I murder somebody, that's an unwholesome decision, and the result is I go to jail. Mm -hmm. That's gamma. Or let's just say I murder somebody and I run away and I start trying to evade the authorities, and now I have fear, I have guilt, I can't live in one place, I have to move from place to place to place to place, I can't really hold a job because I'm running from the law. This is gamma. So the decision to kill somebody that this person made had unwholesome consequences because the decision to kill is an unwholesome decision, so therefore it has unwholesome consequences. And then conversely, okay. if I steal, 
that's an unwholesome decision and it's going to have unwholesome results. Or if I have sexual misconduct, if I'm harming with my sexual conduct, like I'm cheating on my partner or I rape somebody or I have sex with a minor, you know, a young kid, these are unwholesome decisions that lead to unwholesome results. Or if I lie, this is an unwholesome decision. It's going to have unwholesome results. Or if I take intoxicants, substances that cause the mind to be unalert, this is an unwholesome decision, so it leads to unwholesome results. So the Buddhist teachings actually go through and teach you all these various decisions that if you make these decisions, it's going to lead to unwholesome results. The natural law of gamma, it's not administered by anybody. It's not a punishment and reward system mm -hmm. with God kind of overlooking it. That's kind of like yeah. a Christian view. What the natural law of gamma is, is it's like right here, right now. It's like you contacted me. You were very polite and kind and you invited me to come be on your YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And because you were polite and kind, I chose to say, sure, I'll come to your YouTube channel. Okay. Whereas if you were rude or angry or hostile or arrogant or egotistical, it wouldn't have probably had the same result. I wouldn't have come and right. agreed to be on YouTube. <laughs> this is gamma. So your gamma is that you're a nice, friendly, polite guy. And when you talk with people, people are willing to help you because you're nice and friendly, polite and kind. These are good, wholesome decisions that you're making so they have good, wholesome results. Okay. This is the natural law of gamma. And the more that you learn the Buddhist teachings, what he does is his teachings awaken your mind to understanding this natural law of gamma so that you can make good choices in your life. He doesn't tell you what choices to make, but he gives you kind of like a framework or as you said, like a philosophy in which to reflect and make good decisions in your life. But ultimately, you make the decisions. And what his mind was is it was awakened to this natural law, and he taught about this natural law. And the more you learn about the natural law, you can make good decisions in those same ways so that you have good results, good wholesome results. And this is why... God isn't punishing and rewarding us for certain things. We're actually producing the results for ourselves. Right. God didn't right. tell you to be polite, kind, and peaceful. He didn't do that for you. You did it. Right. You chose right. to be polite and kind and friendly, and that's why you got the good results. Yeah. God, did, <laughs> God didn't do this for you, right? So that's natural law of gamma. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I feel so enlightened now. Am I in Nirvana now? <laughs> well, more than one conversation for you to get to enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really love your answers. I really love speaking to you. I feel like Buddhism is really the the best, if not one of the best religions or philosophy, beliefs, laws that man needs to know about. I'm really excited to share this video of our conversation to my fellow man. Because I'd like, uh, I'd like them to discover what Buddhism is. Uh, this is something that they need during this COVID-19 crisis. They need to think positively instead of stressing out. And what's really important for your viewers to understand is if they're currently Christian or Islam or any other tradition, they can maintain those traditions and those beliefs while they're still learning and practicing the Buddhist teachings. Because Jesus was teaching you to be a very kind and polite and friendly person as well, yeah. the Buddhist teachings are only going to complement those. So because you're not worshiping the Buddha, because he's not a savior, because he's not a god, because he's not a messiah, he's not a lord, he's just a human being who's a teacher, you can learn his teachings and implement them into your life and see the results for yourself right alongside of the teachings of Jesus Christ or Prophet Muhammad or anyone else that you might have grown up with. Great. So a Christian can be a Buddhist, an atheist can be a Buddhist, and a Muslim can be a Buddhist at the same time. Exactly. It's open to all people. That's one of the beauties about Buddhism. It is, it is indeed uh, very beautiful, I can say. I must declare that I am now a Buddhism. 
I'm now Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. I'll, I'll send you a link for a book that you can download. Yeah, and you sure. Can share, you can share it with your viewers if you want. You can put it in the comment section of your video sure. and they can download it and they can learn. And from that book, I also have a YouTube channel and podcast and mm -hmm. other resources where they can learn online for free. So I'll share all those links with you. Sure. I'd love to watch your videos, listen to your podcasts and share them to my friends so they will be en enlightened, <laughs> enlightened about Buddhism. I'm, yeah, I'm, so, I'm so grateful that I spoke to you today. I mean, I learned a lot. I feel more positive now. Excellent, Charles. I'm glad to hear that. And anytime you want to talk, just let me know. Sure. I'll just send you some, uh, if I have any more questions, if I need help with something else. Okay? Sounds good, buddy. Okay. David, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate that. All right. Como esta? <laughs> thank you. Take Como care. Esta? All right. Take care. <laughs> okay. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.